what's going on you guys it's d machine again bringing you another know your enemies video today i'm going to be talking to you guys about windwalker monks uh now in 3v3 arenas windwalker monks aren't very high-end viable you know what i mean uh there's currently 17 windwalker monks above 2500 rating on the united states 3v3 ladder system um they are second to last in viability when it comes to uh viable specs uh last being rep paladins of course we suck um but uh even though that they're like second to last in viability and when i say viability i mean like i'm not obviously not counting prot warriors prot healers arcane mages demonology warlocks even like the the, the specs that blizzard specifically made not to be viable in pvp you understand like blizzard obviously had an idea what classes they were going to make viable and specs they were going to make viable um uh, and what uh, specs they weren't because there's no way there's too many variables to make every spec viable in the game and they're having problems with just anything but warlock or rogues warlocks mages and warriors which have always sort of been kind of viable so uh but that being said windwalker monks are actually the most viable 1v1 uh, 1v1ers in the entire game. I mean, they have amazing mobility, very short defensive cooldowns, um, decent healing, and awesome stuns. That, And also, on top of that, uh, they have their stacks of brew, which they could actually gain stacks of brew, which is their big cooldown, uh, without even hitting a target. And I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, but first, let's talk defensives. So the very first defensive I want to talk to you guys about, and actually the most common defensive that just about everyone knows about at this point, is Touch of Karma. It redirects all damage back to the uh, to the player that the monk originally targeted. Um, when the spell is casted, uh, the amount of damage that's going into the monk cannot exceed the total monk's health. Um, but something to note about this ability is it creates both a buff and a debuff for the monk. Uh, it creates a buff for the monk and puts a debuff on the target. Now, um, that debuff can be removed, um, and if the debuff is removed, then the monk is no longer deflecting damage back at that target but he is still absorbing damage right he's still absorbing the damage and not taking the full amount of damage but he's still also um not deflecting it back if they get rid of that debuff now to get rid of the the buff and the debuff completely you need an ability like divine shield or uh even uh, or not divine yeah divine shield or ice block to be to completely uh negate both buff and debuff uh also take into consideration the very short cooldown it has it's only a minute and a half that's shorter than most uh, Swifty macros, right? So every Swifty macro, he's going to have a Karma up for you. And most good monks probably won't even use that because they have a lot of other defensive cooldowns. And I'll talk to you guys about that in just a second. Um, but yeah, it lasts about 6 seconds. And the Absorb itself, the, the buff that the monk gives, lasts about 10 seconds. Take that into consideration. Fortifying Brew is the next ability I want to talk to you guys about when it comes to the Windwalker Monk. It's basically something that we refer to as the Monk's Wall, and that refers back to the Warrior's Shield Wall, of course. But uh, So, it reduces your damage by 20% and also increases your health by 20%. Combining that 20% health increase with like a Health Stone or some Monk off-healing on himself uh, will be uh, a big difference. Uh, it actually could probably prevent some defensive cooldowns to be used from the team, uh, whether that's a defensive cooldown from the healer or the monk using Touch of Karma. So Zen Meditation. Um, Zen Meditation is basically an ability that allows you to eat other abilities that are being casted on your team. So if your healer is about to get cycloned because they just got disoriented by a stealth druid and a druid cycloning, you can start the cast of Zen Meditation, and if the channel isn't interrupted, you will eat that cyclone for your healer because you'd rather be cycloned than your healer, right? Um, so it's really useful to not only eat the cyclones, but also chaos bolts. Now, if you're facing a monk and they're Zen Meditating, if you're a melee, if you just kick that early, they can't eat anything, and it actually locks them out of quite a few things. Um, but uh, Detox is another ability that is used by monks it it, uh, it gets rid of poisonous and disease effects now detox is very useful and i think even underused by a lot of monks um detox for example if you're facing a shadow priest a shadow priest when using a three point devouring plague can really hurt your team and if you're fast on the detox spell on devouring plague you can actually negate a lot of that shadow priest's damage now um not only that but you can also use detox to get your healer out of a Werven sting 
or even get rid of DK diseases, which uh, reduces their damage by quite a bit if you use detox on cooldown when your DK in like a warrior DK is tunneling your healer. That can be a really big deal in getting rid of those diseases. So detox definitely look to use it more often and get it key bind not only you but your other partners something that i don't think is said often enough but for monks to be viable in 3v3 arena their mobility needs to be there monks are very squishy um other than monks that use healing elixirs and stuff like that but monks are very squishy and their mobility is required to be used so when you're thinking about going on a monk Sorry about that. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that's fireworks going off because, as you can see, it is July 4th, Independence Day here in America. Uh, so, happy July 4th to everyone. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, mobility with monks is super important. Uh, it should be used, actually, it should be considered a defensive cooldown. So, when you're considering going on a monk, absolutely take into that into effect because, uh, depending on which map you get, a monk will be a more or less viable option. So, for example, if you get uh, a monk on Dalran Sewers, he's not going to be able to run away nearly as far as he would, say, on Tolveron, right? I mean, Tolveron is a huge, vast map. Um, Dalaran Sewers, you can't run away too, too far. You can run to a certain distance, so that's something to take into consideration when choosing your kill target. Diffuse Magic is a talent um, that reduces 90% magic damage that is going to be taken and also clears the amount of uh, magic effects that uh, are on the monk, debuffs in particular, for 6 seconds it reduces this damage. Now, um, when facing like a heavy melee comp, like a KFC or something like that, you're going to see monks often switching this talent up for healing elixirs that heal the monk every single for 15% of its health uh, every single time the monk drops below 35% health or whenever the monk uses a brew or a tea. Which, honestly, to be honest with you, they're using brews quite often. They're generating that those tiger eye brews quite often. So, uh, it's actually very nice when you're facing uh, comps like uh, oh, like melee comps that diffuse magic is never really going to be utilized. But um, this uh, this ability is also like the passive 35% when you're under 35% health. It's going to make the monk feel a lot tankier than, say, if he had diffuse magic. Then there's obviously transcendence that follows in the category of monk mobility as their defensive cooldown. But transcendence is a lot like a, a warlock portal. It can be used as offensive as well. Um, now, but one thing that I want to point out, uh, that inside of a Windwalker monk named Balance, uh, he wrote in his guide on Arena Junkies, and I'll link the guide in the info below, that when he puts his transcendence down, he also puts three orbs next to it, because when he's using his transcendence to get out, he oftentimes needs to be healed. It's used usually defensively. So that's pre something pretty cool to take into consideration. If you are a Windwalker monk, put some orbs down next to your transcendence, and then when you uh, port back, you are healed instantaneously. And you, I mean, you probably have dots on you, probably really low. So that's just something else uh, to definitely improve your game. Now I want to talk about offensives, and right away I want to talk about Tiger Eye Brew. Uh, Tiger's Eye Brew is the big damage buff that monks have. Uh, but it's not like a cooldown like majority of other classes have. It is a consumable. Not necessarily a consumable, but it's something that needs ramp up time. Uh, but not nearly as much as you might think. Now, uh, for every stack of Tiger's Eye Brew you consume, you increase your damage by 6%. And uh, the most amount of stacks that you can use at one time is 10 stacks of Tiger's Eye Brew. So they have the ability to increase their damage by 60%, um, which is fantastic. Um, but they are able to keep 20 stacks of Tiger Eyes Brew at one time. Now, uh, something that a lot of people kind of look over is uh, the uh, the talent uh, Chi Brew. What Chi Brew does is it's basically a two charge ability that gives you two Chi and two stacks of Brew. So right away, before you do any damage as a Windwalker Monk, you can use two charges of this, and you can have four stacks of Brew and four stacks or four stacks of Chi. Or not stacks of Chi, but four Chi, right? Um, and then with that four Chi, right away, you can actually put someone into a Fist of Fury, generating even more stacks of Brew. Now, if you land four strikes with your Fist of Fury, you have eight stacks of Brew at this point. You have eight stacks of Brew on your third global cooldown as a Monk. That is amazing. So the ramp up time isn't really necessarily there, you know what I mean? Like there is a little bit of ramp up, but to be honest with you, that's 
pretty fast considering you can just generate that you'll be generating more stacks of brew more often than someone who has a two minute cooldown on their burst so take that into consideration that monks still even though they have a ramp up time still can burst relatively quickly and a lot more often than say um rat paladins <laughs> uh, the next ability i want to talk about is rushing jade wind now it's the level 90 tier uh talent that you kind of choose over uh, the giant tiger Zwin or whatever his name is. Uh, a lot of monks don't like to go that tiger because he breaks CC. He's clunky. It's just not something that is very controlled. So a lot of monks go rushing Jade Win, and it doesn't do an absurd amount of damage. But they don't like to use this without intentively about to do a lot of damage. So uh, because they don't want to break CC with it. So. If they have a lot of energy and they're usually about to burst you, that's when you're going to see this rushing Jade Wind. And that's a lot of monks. Even a lot of top tier monks do this. Even Venruki I've seen when he's about to use his stacks of brew, he starts his rushing Jade Wind because he has an abundance of energy because he's been saving up those cheese, right? So take that in consideration. When you see rushing Jade Wind and you're facing an experienced monk, you get ready for some brew to be used as well. Some serious cooldowns. So Spear Hand is their kick, but it also is a two second uh, blanket silence. So just understand that if you're getting silenced by something for two seconds, that's what it is. Uh, not the biggest deal in the world considering that they do have like a slight delay, like a half a second delay when using their Spear Kit to, uh, to blanket silence someone. But um, definitely useful i mean i wish i had a blanket silence on a rep paladin right um but this is the final section of my guide and it is the best section of my guide and it is called tips and tricks so these are mostly tips and tricks for monks to be honest with you um but um first thing i want to uh talk about is provoke provoke is basically a monk's taunt but it's super underrated and underused this taunt can eat grounding totems um, can also take spell reflex and keeps a rogue out of combat from being able to re-stealth, keeps a healer in combat from being able to, um, drink and, and even can, has the ability to taunt pets on you. So why would you ever want a pet to be taunted on you? Well, say you have a, a few chi and you're taunting the hunter's pet and you're kind of going through this limbo period where they're both kind of resetting. You taunt those pets and then go ahead and, um... Uh, Fist of Fury, the pet dead, behind the line of sight of the pillar, and the hunter can't do anything about it. Uh, and then the hunter has to cast that 1.5 second cast to be able to get the pet back, which can be sort of difficult when, um, when, uh, you're on him, and you're a monk, and you have lots of mobility, right? Not only that, but if you taunt some pets around the pillar, and you have a mind, you can also generate some brew. And that's always nice, right? Free brew. Um, then the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is generating brew. Uh, now, this is kind of an unknown sort of uh, strat, but uh, if you are a rogue and you use evasion on a monk, when a monk blackout kicks you and it's dodged, it doesn't take away, it doesn't cost any chi, but it still generates that stack. So say like a rogue pops evasion on you and, you're, and the rogue wasn't sure that he was about to take a ridiculous amount of damage, basically that evasion, if you just spam blackout kick into it, you're generating brew for the cost of nothing. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and I think that's underrated and not talked about enough. Uh, it should still cost some chi if you are getting brew. That's my opinion. But when Walker Monks start abusing the hell out of that, because there's obviously not the results uh, out there to make you guys yet viable. So take the things that you have and abuse the shit out of them until you are viable. I mean, that's basically what everyone else does. That's LSD in a nutshell. Uh, so that's the end of my episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. If you did, please hit that subscribe button. Totally helps me out. And also check out my live stream at twitch.tv slash dmachine52. I answer any question about any class live all the time. I'm currently always active with my stream. And I love to stream um, from 7 to around 9. I start p.m. Eastern time. Um, and I stream all the way to midnight, and then at midnight, I always have scary story time. So, it's a lot of fun. Come check me out live, and I will see you there. D-Machine, blast off.